Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of you joining us today for the second year of our memorial lecture to the beloved friend, teacher, and colleague David Graeber. Today we're very grateful to be joined for a talk by Michael Hart on three experiments in the dual organization in the 1970s. Um, today we're going to be having simultaneous English to French interpretation. Thank you, Blandine and Danielle, our interpreters, and our partner, Simone Treblay Pepin from the School of Social Innovation at St. Paul University will explain that briefly now. Bonjour tout le monde, uh, hello everyone. So I'll, I'll make it just a brief announcement in French so people who want to have translation in, uh, in English can know how to do it. Uh, but if you'd like for any reason <laughs> have interpretation in French, you also can using the interpretation button at, button at the bottom of your screen. Bonjour tout le monde, pour uh, ceux qui parlent français, uh, vous avez un bouton interprétation tout au bas de l'écran. Euh, sur lequel vous pouvez choisir la langue euh, de votre choix. Donc, dans ce cas-ci, vous entendrez la conférence en anglais, qui sera la, la langue de notre conférencier. Mais vous pouvez choisir, en appuyant sur français, d'avoir une traduction simultanée en français. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This event is a co-production, an effort of collaboration between several universities across the world, including the Department of Anthropology at the London School of Economics and Political Science, the Elizabeth Briere School of Social Innovation at St. Paul University, Rojava University, the School of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Autonomous University of Puebla or PUAP, and our Department of Anthropology and Social Change at the California Institute of Integral Studies. I wanna thank um, Sean, express uh, a deep gratitude to you, Sean, our program manager for all of your work coordinating and preparing for this talk. We wouldn't be able to enjoy this lecture today without his logistical and administrative labor. Um, and folks can feel free to chat Sean if there's a question about the talk. Um, and then we'll have questions for the end for Michael Hart, and you can put them into the chat or ask them yourselves. We'll explain that again at the end. Uh, so again, welcome everyone to the second annual uh, David Graeber Memorial Lecture. Michael Hart is hardly a person who needs an introduction as possibly one of the most influential political and literary theorists of our times. With co-author Antonio Negri, Michael wrote the Empire Trilogy in which they offer a comprehensive and critical analysis of the unfolding of the expansion of world capital and globalization. These books and those that Hart and Negri have authored since have shaped how scholars and activists understand both contemporary capitalism and the need for real democratic alternatives. The joint focus on the possibilities contained within experiments in democratic governance be it in the struggles of the alter globalization movement, the Occupy protests, or other moments since, brought Michael and David together. David had a keen interest in the Italian uh, autonomous politics that Michael worked with. But Michael was not only an important intellectual influence for David Graeber, he was also a friend. Michael ends a farewell article to David with a statement that I think we may all agree with. David will remain for me a model for how to live the fullest of a scholarly and activist life. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Great, thanks, Michelle. Uh, thanks, Anche. Thanks, Sean, for, um, for organizing this. I'm really happy to be here with you all. It's almost obligatory now that we say in these things, I really wish I were actually with you. I really miss being together, but in the meantime, um, this will have to do. I, um, what I'm presenting today is part of a work in progress, and I hope it will uh, make enough sense. The project, uh, the whole project uh, book uh, is called The Subversive 70s, and it's a um, trying to draw from the revolutionary movements of the 70s and arguing that the movements of the 70s are in fact more interesting and more relevant for us than those of the 60s. However great the struggles of the 60s were, uh, it seems to me that they belong in many ways to a previous era. They were a culmination in some sense uh, and an endpoint. Whereas the 70s begin 
our own era and the revolutionary and liberation movements then uh, first encounter the political problems that we still face. This is the argument of the book as a whole. Um, and so uh, part of the many of the chapters in the book uh, try to talk about how in the 1970s, the joint projects of liberation and democracy uh, shifted and in some ways to grapple simultaneous with multiple struggles for liberation, articulation among anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist struggles, anti-racist struggles, feminist struggles, gay liberation struggles, and many others. Um, and these are ones that I'm working on in other chapters. Um, in fact, it could be at the end, you'll regret that I didn't in some ways present a different chapter that you would have found more interesting. But this one, the one I, I'm, I'm working through at least parts of today, uh, has to do with armed struggle. Uh, it seems to me that one particularly difficult problem that arises uh, in the 1970s are dilemmas, is the dilemma of, uh, of armed struggle. On the one hand, clandestine arms groups were prevalent and took an, a, a really un, um, inordinate uh, amount of the uh, attention. I'm thinking of clandestine armed groups in Italy, Japan, Germany, the US, Argentina, Uruguay, and elsewhere. And many of the problems that they encountered, it seems to me, um, and this is the work of, of something that I won't be talking about today, is their separation from the dynamics and the debates of the movements themselves. So what, I'm, um, what I am trying to present today, and this is not directly having to do with David's work, but a theme that seemed to me to resonate with, with some of his interests and of my memories with him, so in this chapter, and, and in particular, also thinking about David's experiences in relation to Rojava, and maybe I'm hoping at the end that that could be uh, something we could talk more about. Um, because I think that in Rojava, in the last decade, uh, there have been particularly significant contribution to the tradition that I'm talking about from 50 years ago about the conducting at once a dual strategy and double organization. That's what I'm trying to work through. And I'm gonna um, work through this in three historical contexts. In some ways, I'm gonna be presenting the three histories and then, and then trying to, along the way, express why I'm admiring it. This is really what's, I guess, is going through. Yeah, as I said, uh, this, is, this is a work in progress. Uh, those of you who know me know that I have a tendency to uh, doubt myself and even more with a work in progress, I'm sure as I go along, having you present will even inspire me to doubt myself more. Um, but anyway, you can live with it. Uh, so here we go. Um, yeah, I'll skip as I need be, as need be. The extreme forms of repression in the 1970s created a double bind for liberation movements. On the one hand, the movements were confronted by extraordinary violence and were effectively destroyed if they could not defend themselves and the broader community from a host of threats that varied in each national context, police violence, government surveillance and infiltration, fascist gangs and death squads, right-wing terrorism, imprisonment, and more. On the other hand, the formation of militarized armed groups often forced into clandestinity, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, although they were capable of striking against the state and the forces of reaction, defending against fascist groups in many contexts too. Although they were able to do this, they became unable to organize social and political projects and were effectively separate from participating in the debates and dynamics of the movements. Either way, the organizational projects of social and political liberation were undermined. Some liberation groups in the 70s, however, and this is what I'm interested in here, sought to evade this double bind by creating dual organizations that held together in tension two relatively separate initiatives, a defensive militarized structure and a socially engaged liberation project. Each of these was ultimately defeated, the ones I'm gonna be talking about and all the others too. But the project of dual strategy provides, at least in my view, an important model for constructing uh, and defending liberation projects in the face of extreme violence and, and repression with the the translators will raise their hands if I'm going too fast, but it seems like so far we're okay. 
Okay. So I'm going to talk about three uh, uh, Black Panther Party first, which I'm sure many of you know much about, but nonetheless seems like a good ground. The second about autonomia in Italy, and the third uh, uh, Debrimci Yol in Turkey. Um, very different ones, but I'm hoping that if you're bored by the Black Panther Party part because you know it too well, at least you'll see how it's setting the ground for my problematic. The meteoric rise to fame of the Black Panther Party in, in 1967 and 68 was due to the audacity and effectiveness of its tactics of armed self-defense for the Black community, and correspondingly to the brutality of the police and state repression it suffered. Party members with shotguns at the state sa uh, Sacramento State House, the Free Angel and Free Bobby campaigns, the assassinations of Bobby Hutton, Fred Hampton, and others, spectacular images and slogans around these events thrust the party almost immediately onto center stage with the national and international political consciousness in a way that few revolutionary organizations in the US have ever achieved. The first and most powerful message communicated was that, was, was that was, there was a civil war going on in the US, a war against black people, which didn't begin of course with the Panthers and had indeed been going on in various guises since the middle passage. In this context, the mere presence of the party along with the extraordinary violence unleashed against them, seemed to serve as a catalyst to refine people's political vision, allowing them finally to see the war that had long been right in front of them. The action served too as a demonstration that black people can fight back. In this first guise then, at the center of their politics, as is the, from the Bloom and Martin book, uh, Bloom and Martin write, at the center of their politics was the practice of armed self-defense against the police. That was obvious, okay. And for this, the party necessarily adopted a militarized figure through its rhetoric, style, organization, and actions. In subsequent years, however, primarily between 1969 and 1970, emerged a second guise or aspect of the, of the Black Panther Party, which didn't substitute for but supplemented the first the establishment of a host of community service and political education programs demonstrated some degree of autonomy from the state. The free best breakfast program for children, right, began in Oakland in January 1969 and by April, after the program had spread to several other cities, the party claimed to be feeding 1200 children a day. The breakfast program worked something like this. Party members solicited food donations from local businesses, sometimes with mild coercion, they prepared meals. They often picked up the children from their homes. And while the children ate, they provided liberation lessons on black history and other topics. In 1969 and 1970, the Panthers initiated in cities across the country an extraordinary array of community programs, including free health clinics, sickle cell anemia research, freedom schools, bus transport to visit, to visit prison inmates and housing cooperatives. Internal FBI documents reveal that FBI Director Edgar Hoover considered the Breakfast for Children program in particular, famously, an, extraordinarily, uh, an extremely dangerous threat and thus the primary target of FBI actions. One shouldn't rely on Hoover, of course, for political judgments about the importance of these, these activities, but his fears and anxieties are indications of how much attention the programs received. This second level or second face of the party was engaged in the constitution of a relatively autonomous welfare structure. These two coexisting aspects of the party, really two different structures, that's what I'm, uh, were certainly coherent at an ideological level insofar as they both defended the black community and asserted autonomy, but they did occupy very separate social spheres, were generally conducted by different groups of party members and required different, even conflicting forms of organization. Although there were exceptions, the gender division between these two parts of the party generally mapped uh, to the dominant gender division of labor, whereas the military face of the party was male dominated, especially in the early years, the welfare face was largely conducted by women. Furthermore, military strategy tends to require centralized organization, discipline, and chain of command, and the party's upper leadership structure with its array of titles reflected the centralized organizational structure. Welfare strategy, in contrast, requires widely distributed structures of accountability, allowing those responsible for a specific social service or task substantial latitude in organizing and fulfilling these tasks. By highlighting this bifurcation, the distance in terms of strategy and organization uh, between the military and welfare aspects of the party, 
And moreover, the tension between the forms of organization that each required, centralized versus decentralized, I don't intend to criticize the party as internally contradictory or incoherent. On the contrary, it was a great accomplishment for the Panthers to be able to keep this tension alive and to hold together, as long as they did, this dual strategy and double organization. A major factional dispute within the party, which came to a head in 1971, highlighted how difficult it was to maintain the relation between the two sides. Reducing the complexities of the positions a great deal, one, you, you could say, or I would say, one faction associated with Eldridge Cleaver advocated that the party emphasize its military vocation and insurrectional strategy, lamenting the party's turn toward social programs. Whereas the faction around David Hilliard and after his prison release, Huey Newton, advocated emphasis on the social programs over the military. Cleaver left the party in April 1971, and in the subsequent years, more due to external forces than these internal disputes, of course, the party experienced a rapid decline. It would have been disastrous in my view for the party to abandon either side. On the one hand, given the state of violent repression in the late 1960s and early 70s, especially against black liberation movements and the Panthers most of all, it's no exaggeration to say that they were thrust unwillingly into a civil war. Sorry. One can certainly question whether their tactics were most effective, whether arms should have been deployed and if so, what kind and how, if their engagements with the police were effective and so forth. But developing social programs while neglecting to organize structures of defense and resistance would have been in my view irresponsible. On the other hand, if the Black Panther Party had developed as exclusively or even predominantly a military formation, it would have inevitably been isolated from the movements and grassroots organizing. The emergence of the Black Liberation Army in the early 1970s and its differences from the Black Panther Party illustrate this point. The Black Liberation Army was dedicated explicitly to armed struggle, although its organization was decentralized with no established chain of command. And because it was a clandestine organization, it did not have the opportunity to create um, programs or any such political community projects. Although the Black Liberation Ar Army conducted bank robberies and airline hijackings primarily to raise funds, the primary focus of its actions were against the police, including targeted killings most often presented as retaliation, either for actions of those specific officers or for large scale events such as the attacks on prisoners during the 1971 Attica prison uprising. Many Panthers and former Panthers, uh, this is again, uh, Bloom and Martin um, report this, uh, that many Panthers and former Panthers admired the heroics of the, of the Black Liberation Army guerrillas, as did of course many on the left. But in political terms, the Black Liberation Army, quoting uh, Bloom and Martin again, direct, uh, their direct organization of guerrilla warfare was a world apart from the politics of armed self-defense, which the Black Panther Party th had thrived on which had thrived, okay. Furthermore, and as a consequence of their dedication to guerrilla warfare and their organization as an army, the Black Liberation Army had only a single mandate and was thus unburdened by the dual strategy that characterized the Panthers. Okay, that's, I'm not sure about that last sentence. Anyway, my intention is not to crit criticize the Black Liberation Army. And in another chapter of the project, I explore the intensities of, of armed struggle uh, in similarly armed uh, clandestine groups. Instead, I simply want here to use it as a foil to highlight how unusual and difficult to maintain was the dual nature of the Black Panther Party. One might say in very broad historical terms that on one side, the many Black nonviolent civil rights organizations of the 60s dedicated their energies to the political community work without great attention to defensive military organization. On the other side, organizations like the Black Liberation Army were dedicated primarily to the military without the political organizing, the Panthers were a rare moment movement that attempted to maintain a dual strategy and a dual organization. And for a period, they even made it work. Perhaps that doubleness is the greatest legacy that the Panthers have bequeathed to us. I'm just looking to be sure I haven't screwed up yet. And nobody in the translators seem okay. Okay, I'm gonna continue. 
And I'm going to shift to Italy and, and in some ways trying to recognize, even though not uh, coordinated with the Black Panther Party at all or, or, or even inspired by them, a similar kind of organization in Italy. All the Italian political developments of the 1970s that I worked on in a, in a separate chapter. Um, and there I was, I should try to uh, highlight what, what has interested me most about the Italian experience. Yeah, let me try it in three sentences. It's in another chapter. It more or less moving, what interests me is, um, what I think is somewhat perhaps unique about Italy in the 1970s is how coherently they moved or some of the movements moved from a focus on the centrality of the industrial worker and the uh, enormous success of autonomously organized uh, industrial workers in the beginning of the decade, how through the transition of capitalist attack on, on, on the factories and on workers facilitated by economic crisis, how they, how they managed to transition to democratic projects that were multiply based it was for them didn't mean the end of class struggle. It meant recognizing the multiplicities of forms of labor, but also the possibilities of articulation among workers' movements, movements that are employed, feminist movements, gay liberation movements, et cetera. And it's this in the in autonomia that most interests me. It's complicated and I'll, and it's uh, partial, but uh, but this is in some ways what I'm what I'm referring to. I hope that made enough sense that uh, as a as a background for this. So all of those political developments in the 70s took place against the backdrop of extreme fear, tension, and violence. Italians often refer to the 70s as the years of lead, the anni di piombo, you know, gun really too, you know, lead that sense, uh, bullets. Um, and in these other chapters, in fact, throughout this project, I try to defer the question of violence and the development of military formations on the left Primarily because the drama and spectacle of arms tend to obscure the political developments and problems that I want most to emphasize in the project as a whole. That said, however, the decisions made by the movements, the obstacles they faced, how the, their aims were distorted and the causes of their defeat can't be understood without situating them in that atmosphere of violence and repression. Furthermore, after having investigated briefly the dual strategy and double organization of the Black Panther Party a minute ago, I'm better in position to elaborate how the Italian revolutionary movements negotiated the tensions between their political projects and the need for organized self-defense, sometimes with arms. For Italian activists in the 70s, like for the Black Panthers, violence versus nonviolence wasn't the debate. Instead, a more pressing issue was to decide what kind of force to deploy and how best to organize it. To understand this relation to violence, one needs to appreciate the intensity of the repression that activists had to confront. In the late 1960s and early 70s, social and revolutionary movements in Italy, as in many other countries, were battered by increasing waves of repression from the police and the state, at times in league with fascist groups. Violence, sometimes deadly against protests and strikes, disinformation campaigns, layoffs of activist workers, provocations and entrapment, targeted assassination of leaders, preventive detention, illegal arrests, much more. The Italian government or elements within it conducted what they called or what was called at the time a, a, a strategy of tension uh, that encouraged political violence on the left and the right in order to create a chaotic situation that would subsequently justify police and state repression. It became clear to Italian activists, this too was shared with activists in many other countries, that protest alone was no longer effective and that faced with such violence and repression, revolutionary movements had to invent new tactics. Some activists of course chose to, with, to, to uh, withstand the repression path. Some activists chose to withstand the repression passively as best they could or to retire from activism altogether. But the majority developed strategies of self-defense and eventually armed combat in various forms. The militarization of the movements was much criticized and hotly debated at the time, but, the second, but by the second half of the decade, Italy was in a state of low intensity civil war punctuated by flashes of high intensity. The repression came first. And to give some indication of it, let me focus on a single event which quickly became iconic 
and charged with political significance in Italy. On December 12, 1969, a bomb planted at a bank in Piazza Fontana in Milan, Italy, killed 17 and injured 88. The developments after the attack seem like a Hollywood movie script, but one sure to be rejected by producers for being too absurd. Later that same day of the bombing, police arrested and accused two well-known anarchists, Pietro Valpreda and Giuseppe Pinelli. Despite the fact, which many were parked at the time, that such a deadly bombing was completely outside the repertoire of practices of the anarchists and other far left groups. Anarchists had, did have a tradition of exploding small bombs at symbolic locations where they could ensure there would be no casualties. The Piazza Fontana bombing instead was designed to create mass casualties. Three days after the explosion, the Milan police reported that Pinelli had died in custody, claiming quite implausibly that he had committed suicide by jumping out the four story window of the police station. Gradually over the course of months and years, what those on the left suspected immediately was confirmed. The arrested anarchists had nothing to do with the bombing and the police were di directly responsible for Pinelli's death, one of the accused anarchists, but more alarming evidence emerged too. Fascist activists were in fact the perpetrators of the bombing and they were aided in its planning and realization by elements of the police and the secret service with connections going all the way to the top government officials. Details remain murky to the day as to today, until today, as they often do in such cases, but the broad confirmed outlines of the event are enough to be shocking, or should be shocking. An attack planned and carried out through the collaboration of police, state, and fascist forces, designed falsely to inculpate leftist activists, resulted directly and intentionally in the scores of dead and injured as collateral damage. This was the first in a series of political attacks in subsequent years that came to be called uh, state massacres, stragi di Stato, uh, conducted with almost complete impunity. Lotto Continua, uh, a revolutionary political party, launched immediately after the bombing an, ex an extensive political campaign uh, to denounce the real perpetrators of the, of the bombing attack at Piazza Fontana and its aftermath, highlighting the culpability and complicity of the police and the state. The campaign was def a defining project for the party and gained great admiration from others on the left. Lotto Continua mobilized to make certain that the bombing and Pinelli's death were not covered up or silenced. In particular, the party led a sustained denunciation of the Milan police off official, Luigi Calabresi, who was not only responsible for P Pinelli's interrogation, but also in previous years, had led police surveillance and investigation of leftist activism. It came to light later that Calabresi, the police officer, had indeed prior to this Piazza Fontana bombing entrapped, falsely accused and imprisoned other anarchists for smaller bombings. In other words, Piazza Fontana bombing was a rehearsed police strategy. This counter information project, a really truth project uh, spearheaded by Lotto Continua regarding Piazza Fontana corresponded to a number of other contempor contemporaneous political efforts in the mid 1970s, really uh, mid, early and mid 1970s to reveal and document the crimes of power in other countries, such as the German SDS campaign to denounce and reveal actions of the Springer publishers, the US anti-war groups that uncovered the crimes of both the war effort in Southeast Asia and the FBI's co-intel program against activists, the first actions of the Tupamaros to document crimes of the Uruguayan ol oligarchy. One might say in retrospect that the Piazza Fontana massacre and the violence and impunity of the police and the state in collaboration with fascist groups set the stage for the escalating and increasingly violent repression in the next decade. Violence by police and factory security squads against demonstrations and strikers became more, more intense. There were repeated incidents of police firing weapons on and in several occasions killing demonstrators in the street. Fascist squads not only conducted small attacks against leftist demonstrations and social centers, but also carried out terroristic attacks that intentionally resulted in mass deaths, including here are the most famous ones or largest ones really. The 1974 bombing of an anti-fascist demonstration in Brescia, killing eight, wounding 100. Uh, the Italicus Express train bombing, 1974, with 12 dead, 48 injured. The 1980 Bologna train station bombing, 85 dead and over 200 uh, wounded. 
There were even credible reports of the danger of a right-wing coup d'etat in Italy in the mid-1970s, which seemed even more plausible after the September 1973 coup in Chile. It remains unclear how close the fears of coup came to reality in Italy, but it was certainly responsible at the time. It was certainly reasonable at the time, excuse me, at the very least to question whether Italy's not too distant fascist past was really that past. Okay, so I, I mean, I really in this, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, for those and maybe remind people who knew a lot about it at the time, I know some of you did, um, about the intensity of the violence in Italy at the time and the state, not only the feeling of civil war, but a, but a, a real state of what I was calling low intensity civil war. Okay, in reaction to the escalating violence and repression, all the radical left movements felt the pressure to construct some means of self-defense. Factory workers were among the first on the left to arm themselves. Organized workers used arms not only to defend themselves against factory guards and police, but also to carry out sabotage in the factory and increasingly as the decade went on to counter reprisals against guards, uh, yeah, to conduct reprisals against far guards, foremen, bosses guilty of abuse. At the massive 1973 Fiat strike in Turin at the auto plant, uh, it was well known that the workers defended the occupied factory with arms and in the surrounding years in other factories too, armed worker cells had been formed. The Italian radical workers were not alone in this regard. Um, and here I talk about how in another chapter in, uh, I talk about the German factories at the time, the US factories at the time in which, in which, um, in which, in which workers, workers were armed, to defend themselves with, with weapons, et cetera. By the mid 1970s, all the major Italian movements recognized the need for self-defense and deployed force in some way. Every worker or student demonstration, of course, at least since the late 60s, organized a security team, Servizio d'Ordine, to protect demonstrators, and if attacked by the police or fascists to respond in self-defense, often with sticks or metal bars. In the course of the 70s, especially in the years when police shot and killed an increasing number of demonstrators, guns were deployed by the movements at demonstrations. Um, and here, of course, it would be a separate question to talk about the, uh, the birth of the clandestine movements in Italy, the Red Brigades, most famous of them, et cetera. But in Autonomia, this is what I wanted mostly to talk about, uh, uh, a non-clandestine uh, project, as in other groups, a military wing managed, uh, formed to manage the needs of self-defense and it developed in parallel to the political structures uh, that I referred to at the beginning very briefly and that I'd worked on in another chapter. The network of relatively independent collectives focused on different structures of oppression, focusing on different structures of oppression, including wa waged and unwaged, uh, precarious unemployed workers, feminists, gay liberation activists, students, and so forth. Um, this was really the political um, object of, of, of autonomia at its best. In some respects, there were correspondences between the military and political sides of the organization. Emilio Quadrelli, for, for example, uh, in, in the book about Autonomia's military side, emphasizes the plural decentered nature of Autonomia's armed structures and practices in line with its political organization. Here's what uh, Quadrelli writes. He says, from an organizational point of view, and even more so from a political military standpoint, Autonomia operai is more like a ragged set of rushing streams than the flow of a single majestic river. One should also recognize that Autonomia's mass deployment of violence at demonstrations resonates with its mass practices of illegality that I also worked out in another chapter. Uh, mass practices of illegality were housing occupations, uh, so-called self-reduction movements about having to do with transport fares, et cetera, organization of what they call proletarian shopping, you know, uh, making uh, commodities free at, at stores for, for, um, for the poor. Despite the fact that the military wing of Autonomia was relatively decentralized, as Quadrelli claims, it was necessarily shaped by pressures towards central control, as are all military formations, for obvious reasons. First, the acquisition and deployment of arms, as well as planning for military operations, have to maintain secrecy in the interest of protection from legal prosecution. Second, some sort of oversight is required to assure that activists acting independent, independently don't conduct armed actions that are irresponsible and politically counterproductive. Finally, some structure of coordination is required to guarantee that armed actions will be politically effective. 
even though Autonomia's military structures were less divergent from its political organization than other examples of dual strategy, there remains significant disjunction between its democratic inclusive efforts in the political sphere and the demands of effectiveness and discipline even in the military sphere. Indeed, the ways in which activists in Autonomia and in the broader left criticize the militarization of the movements for its distraction from the political work, its distortion of political organizations, its masculinist bravura, and, and much more, all that's indicative of the difficulties of bridging the gap between the two modes of organization. Autonomia's experiment in double organization, however, was not able to develop long a new and dramatically intensified wave of oppression in the second half of the 1970s defeated the revolutionary movements in Italy, including Autonomia. Non-terrorist movements were targeted together with terrorist groups indifferently. Special laws were passed that gave the police and prosecutors expanding powers, allowing preventive detention of political activists for extended periods without charging them, imprisonment for years before coming to trial, highly irregular legal charges, and conviction on the basis of dubious testimony of those turned state evidence. All this despite the protestations of Amnesty International and other human rights organizations. A network of special political prisons was constructed to house the activists and keep them separate from the criminal prison population. Uh, as Patrick Cunningham explains in a, a PhD dissertation, this was the largest roundup of political activists in Western Europe since 1945. 40,000 activists in Italy were accused, 15,000 arrested, 4,000 convicted to short and long sentences, and thousands of others fled in exile. Although the numbers of dead, tortured, and imprisoned in Italy didn't reach the levels of some other countries, Argentina, Chile, Turkey, all come to mind. Each country's repressive history contains unique horrors. The repression in Italy put an end, at least temporarily, to the long period of revolutionary activity and experimentation that culminated in the 70s. But what I wanted to emphasize uh, here is that as another example of this, and as a success, even if defeated, of a double structure that in a, a, a period of facing extreme violence and repression is able to maintain a political project while, um, while also conducting a defensive, even military operation. Okay, here's my third example. And, um, it has to do, it's, it's, it's a much smaller one in, in a way. I mean, a large organization in, in Turkey in the 1970s, uh, Devrimci Yol, Devrimci Yol. And, uh, but in specific in a very small uh, uh, city of Fatsa. Against all odds, an innovative democratic experiment took place at the end of the 70s in Fatsa, a small city on Turkey's Black Sea coast, three, uh, 300 miles Northeast of Ankara. After his 1979 election, the city mayor, Fikri Sonmez, popular, popularly known as Fikri the Tailor, together with the leftist movement Devrimji Yol, uh, which translates as Revolutionary Path, and please for the Turkish um, speakers that are listening, forgive my pronunciation. Um, so the, the, together, the uh, Sonmez, who was elected as mayor, together with the movement, Devrim Chiyol, uh, created people's committees to run many facets of the city government, notably developing and implementing infrastructure projects. In, the, in early 1980, Sonmez, so this is just a year after election, uh, declared that his position of authority had been turned over to the democratic process. Today, he declared at the time, uh, rather than a mayor, the public is in the administration of, of the municipality. The people of Fatsa manage themselves, he claimed. A few months later, after a mere nine months in office, the mayor was arrested and tortured. At his trial, the military prosecutor alleged that he had created a Fatsa commune, reminiscent of the Paris commune, a damning, if rather erudite charge in such an anti-communist context. The former mayor maintained in his defense that giving people a voice and making them decision makers in government, as he had done, was merely a basic requirement of democracy. Uh, Sonmez uh, subsequently died in prison in 1985, five years after that. To understand how the fortunes of Fatsa, this, this small town on the Black Sea coast, and its mayor were reversed so radically and so rapidly 
and moreover, how the improbable democratic experience came about in, this first, in the first place, one has to back up and take account of the complex political situation of Turkey and the Turkish left in the 70s. The FATSA experience was an anomaly in the political scene of the 70s in Turkey, but it helps illuminate two facts. First, the brief so-called FATSA commune. Yeah, and, and I'm using this, I mean, it's the prosecutor who calls it a commune, not the people who are doing it, but I find it amusing nonetheless, okay. In brief, the FATSA commune was a manifestation of a profound desire for democratic participation on the revolutionary left, a symptom of what could have become more prevalent if the constant threat and reality of fascist violence had not been so intense. Second, without the dual strategy and double organization of Devrim Girol, Yol, excuse me, uh, such a democratic experiment amidst the uh, resistance struggles against fascists would not have been possible. In the second half of the 1970s, the Turkish revolutionary left was vibrant, but extraordinarily fractured and sectarian. A 1974 amnesty had freed many imprisoned leftists who flowed into myriad uh, conflicting groups. A major division pitted those following the Soviet line against adherents of the Chinese line, but some organizations refused both sides of that uh, conflict. Among them was Debrimji Yol, the one I'm talking about, the largest movement in the 70s and the, most, well, the one with the most popular support. Anti-fascist struggle was the central pillar of the party. And indeed, fascist violence was extraordinarily widespread and pressing threat in Turkey. The National Movement Party was a fascist presence in parliament and the paramilitary gray wolves were violent action squads that targeted leftists along with ethnic and religious minorities, including Kurds and Alevis. Fascist violence led primarily by the gray wolves accounted for over 5,000 deaths in this period. In these areas of fiercest fascist terror, and here I'm quoting from an MA thesis by um, someone whose last name is Samin, Samin, it, it, it's, excuse me if I have that wrong. Um, in, these, in these years of fiercest fascist terror, it was primarily the militants of Devrim Chiyol who had to bear the brunt of the anti-fascist struggle and local self-defense. In some towns, half of the community was literally under fascist control while the other half was defended by revolutionaries." End quote from uh, Samin. The state, which had murky connections to the fascist groups, clearly could not be counted on to defend against them. In fact, as in Italy, the Turkish state pr pursued something like a strategy of tension in the 1970s. Along with the army, it allowed and even encouraged violent unrest so as to be able to justify its subsequent intervention to restore order and counter the purported communist threat. To defend communities against fascists, Devrimci Yol created throughout the country resistance committees. Uh, this is what they were called. And um, yeah, I guess I won't try uh, giving you the Turkish because it would just embarrass me. Okay, so the, the Devrimci Yol created uh, resistance committees throughout the country. They were open to all. Uh, and these committees constituted the widest based and most outward looking structures of the party. The party didn't have formal membership, but in particular through the resistance committees built a large following. Its organizational structure was designed to be narrow at the top and wide at the bottom. This was their slogan to create the narrowest cadre within the widest mass. The Rimshi uh, Giyo's uh, seven member central committee determined the political line and made strategic decisions. Below them was a general committee with an advisory role that included regional leaders and other key militants. And the base, including these resistance committees, was meant to be as large and open as possible. Corresponding to these different levels of political organization, Debrimci Yol developed two levels of armed organizations. The armed resistance forces, which were composed of resistance committees that I mentioned before, they were relatively decentralized and operated at a local level. Whereas the revolutionary war forces, a second militarized uh, form composed of professional revolutionaries formed something like a guerrilla army and reported directly to the central committee. Debrimci Yol's most innovative political developments took place at its wide base. The military prosecutor facing the mayor, Mayor Sonmez uh, that, I, that I mentioned earlier, mayor of Fatsa, he was not the only one to see foreign ideas at work. 
Some Turkish leftists also viewed the democratic experiments operated at the committees of De Debrimci role as out of place and un-Turkish. Militants who broke with Debrimci role in the late 70s and formed another party, Debrimci Sol, they called revolutionary left this time instead of revolutionary path, was the one I'm talking about mostly. They, for instance, uh, some of the members of that them accused the party I'm talking about most uh, of creating a horizontal organization that they thought was better suited to the dominant capitalist countries. The practices of De Devrimci Yol were not in fact derived from other countries, but I interpret this impression of foreignness, whether welcomed or not, as a mark of their originality. And these innovations didn't come from the narrow summit of Devrimci Yol, but its wide open horizontal base. To appreciate the nature of this base and the political dynamic created there, one has to look more closely at the anti-fascist resistance committees. In addition to combating fascists, the committees functioned as recruitment tools and as hubs of organization and theoretical education. Ultimately, when the fascist threat could be held in check, the resistance committees were intended to be transformed into democratic political projects. This is where it gets uh, interesting for me. Uh, specifically, Devrimci Yol used resistance committees as the basis for participatory institutions of self-governance, including neighborhood or municipal people's committees, as well as factory committees and student committees. The resistance committees were a gateway, in other words, that opened to democratic participation. Defending against fascists was, of course, essential. Without that, nothing else could be done. But the experience of our participation and cooperation in the resistance committees also served as a training in self-governments and created a desire for it. This is the political context that made possible the election of Fikri Sonmez and the FATSA experiment in participatory democracy. Sonmez, a veteran leftist activist allied with, but not a member of, Devrimji Yol, ran for mayor as an independent. For years before the election, Devrimci Yol had been active and gained popularity in the Fatsa area, in particular by leading one campaign to aid hazelnut growers, which is a major economic sector in the region, um, who had been exploited by merchants who offered low prices and usurious loans, and a second campaign to, to combat exploitation and hoarding in the black market economy. I think you can recognize these kind of struggles. The key factor was that fascists, although still a threat, were less powerful in Fatsa and the nearby region, so we're in the Black Sea region, northeast of, of Ankara, that fascists were less uh, of a threat there than elsewhere. The fascists controlled only one neighborhood in Fatsa, which was something like an armed camp. Less energy required for anti-fascist defense meant more for constituting new democratic forms. Resistance committees could thus be transformed into people's committees. Upon his election in October 1979, Sonmez established in each of the 11 districts of the city a people's committee with frequent meetings open to all residents. The committees were designed to allow people to participate in government. And um, maybe I should even step this. The, they, they conducted practical, popular, um, voluntary, uh, participatory um, infrastructure projects having to do with roads, with uh, improving in infrastructure in all kinds of ways. These democratic experiments in Fatsa, however, were not given much room to breathe and grow. Turkish military troops entered Fatsa and took control of the city in July 1980, and uh, the mayor was arrested the, the following month. The crackdown in Fatsa was in some sense a prelude. Uh, in September 1980, so months later, uh, Turkey suffered the third coup d'etat in the history of the Republic. The military claimed it had overthrown the government in order to put an end to political violence and restore order, and in the process it executed dozens and imprisoned hundreds of thousands. The strategy of tension it had in fact served its purpose and come to completion. In the end, perhaps, the military prosecutors charged that Mayor Sonmez together with Debrimci Yol militants had created a Paris commune on the Black Sea was not completely off the mark. Yes, of course, uh, provincial Fatsa is a far cry from metropolitan Paris, and the practical municipal improvements that they made were, were modest, but the essence of the commune, remember Mark saying this, it was its working existence, that is, its participatory governance structures 
the open the possibility of a government of the people by the people. Those were Marx's words about the Paris Commune. The People's Committee and FATSA were precisely that. The real question is, what would the people of FATSA have been able to create if their experiment had been given more than nine months? Or perhaps more importantly, what kinds of participatory government structures would Devrimji Yol and other revolutionary groups have been able to establish elsewhere in Turkey if they had not had to dedicate so much of their energies to defending against fascists? After all, the relatively low threat of fascists is what set FATSA apart and made its experiments possible. What if all the resistance committees could be transformed into people's committees as institutions of participatory democracy? Such con contrapositive conjecture may not be helpful because the fascists threatened Italy in the 1970s um, inside the state and outside the state was an in ineluctable reality. What's certain, however, is that Devrimci Yol's multiple organizational structures allowed it, even in such an unfavorable environment, to organize participatory democratic experiences while accomplishing the necessary tasks of armed resistance. The commune of Fatsa, although a small and brief experiment, is a significant demonstration of the political potentials opened by such a dual strategy. So all three, those are the end of my histories of this, all three of these uh, experiments, the Black Panther Party, Autonomia in Italy, Devrinci Yol in, in Turkey, all of them were defeated in the 70s. But for me, that doesn't negate the importance of the dual strategy they pursued. In the context of extreme repression, including police, police violence, fascist violence, which characterized so many countries in that decade, developing separate political and military organizational structures was absolutely necessary. It was rather, it was, a, it was a strategy that allowed for political possibilities. It would have been insufficient on the one hand to eschew the use of force and all militarized practices if that meant leaving political projects defenseless. On the other hand, the autonomous democratic and social nature of political organizing would have been undermined um, if it were swept up by and subordinated to military logics. It's clearly essential to guarantee a partial separation between the two organizational structures while holding them together in the same overall project. Even though activists undoubtedly pass between them fluidly and may not distinguish between them in their daily practice, the two organizational structures are necessarily in conflict and fundamentally incompatible. Okay, I, I, I should skip, skip that part. Um, although maintaining the two sides together is itself an organizational feat, um, that is, is not sufficient. There's a tendency, especially in the context of violent attacks and states of emergency, to prioritize the military with the presumption that political objectives will wait for a future time when the danger is past. But in fact, the dual strategy must be lopsided in the other direction. This is probably what I should develop here, um, such that the military operations serve merely as instruments to protect and further the political and social organizing initiatives not delaying the political work to a time beyond emergency, uh, beyond the emergency, but pursuing it in the here and now. So um, I'm not proposing today, I mean, I hope that, I mean, okay, I hope that you find some interest in the, in, the, in the historical examples and also can see why I might have chosen this part as, um, something both in relation to um, David, but also thinking about Rojava. Uh, so in other chapters of this project, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are other uh, lessons of the 70s that do have direct application to what movements are doing today in all countries, I would say. Uh, uh, new revolutionary programs of democracy that I find in, in, in revolutionary movements in the 70s, which I think we're in some ways more advanced than those today, which we could learn from projects of liberation, articulations among different struggles. In contrast, this dual strategy uh, is only appropriate, it seems to me, or required when a military defense is necessary and possible. That's why at the beginning I mentioned, and I repeated just a minute ago, I thought of Rojava because I think probably without being aware of the connections to these past organizations, uh, in Rojava is where we have seen developments further along this path, maintaining simultaneously a democratic social project and an effective military uh, defense force. 
I mean, the other example, which could be an interesting one to discuss if you were more inclined to talk about the present or the more recent past than about the 70s, would of course be the Zapatistas who themselves also maintain, it seems to me that um, dual strategy uh, in order to uh, protect a democratic experiment in a context of military hostility. Okay, I'll I'll um, I'll stop there, and I'm and I'm hoping that you will have a way of um, attaching to some of the things I said so that we can have a discussion. <laughs>